let us uh, proceed with the presentation then. Um, um, yes, so uh, Carlton features the only Bachelor of Engineering in Communications Engineering program in Canada. Uh, we are very proud about that elite program. And in Telecommunications Engineering, university ranks number 33 in the world, according to Shanghai rankings. Um, in addition to systems and computer engineering to which I belong, we have a number of uh, departments uh, uh, to whom the content of this presentation is very relevant. Uh, first and foremost, electronics engineering uh, with SCE and electronics. Uh, the two departments form a conventional ECE with uh, more than 60 faculty members. We also have information technology, mechanical, uh, mechanical and aerospace, uh, and computer science. Um, uh, many of the colleagues in those departments, as well as researchers, uh, may find at least parts of this presentation relevant in one way or another. Now, um, I was told that there might be students uh, joining from a mechanical engineering or aerospace engineering program who may not be entirely familiar with these generations business um, uh, without really boring uh, people who have been working in these areas. I have just five, six very quick slides. Please bear with me. Um, uh, first generation analog systems are way back in the history. Uh, I think the interesting discussion started in 1990s when um, 2G networks, uh, especially GSM uh, standard, allowed uh, video mobile telephony, sorry, not video, mobile telephony. And throughout 1990s, uh, mobile communications thrived. And that in the same era, independently, internet became available, browsing, basically. Um, uh, therefore, when it was the time to think on the next generation, it was clear the goal would be mobile internet. So 3G was supposed to enable data communications, mainly video. It was a partial success uh, in the sense that uh, in addition or apart from the air interface, the devices seems, seems to me now in retrospect uh, were not yet ready the screen size was small, uh, browsing was, a was not a pleasant experience, and uh, prices were really high. So video streaming became a great success uh, with the advent of uh, smartphones. iPhone uh, hit the market in summer uh, 2007, I believe. Um, and uh, 4G once again enabled uh, data communications in a comfortable way to a great extent. So we are now entering into the 5G era when it comes to deployment. And the big uh, difference of 5G is that connectivity is going beyond your mobile phone. And we are talking about connectivity in all other industrials and uh, operations including uh, self-driving vehicles, IoT, uh, and things of that sort. Therefore, in my world, within the 5G context, the buzzword is uh, verticals. That is, uh, 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 industries beyond telecommunications. But although 5G, uh, from consumers' viewpoint, not there yet, the community has been, research community has been talking about 5G for a very long time. Before this presentation, I dug into my own presentations and I realized that the very first time I used the term 5G was almost 11 years ago, as you see in the very last bullet. At the time, the discussion was very visionary. It's more about you present your wish list and uh, hope that 5G will enable most of them. Um, as time moved, that uh, uh, um, uncertainty in 5G became less, especially when 
standardization activities started around 2010-15. Now 5G is pretty much out. It has to be deployed. Therefore, it is very new from the user's perspective, but for research community, many of the important decisions are already made. Therefore, it is indeed time to look beyond 5G. By the way, just for accuracy, I have to mention that 5G air interface is more flexible than LTE and previous generations. So we will indeed see quite a bit of uh, evolution within 5G as well. And then another parenthetical remark, uh, uh, in this exercise of looking at the crystal ball, uh, last academic year at Carlton, we had a number of workshops on physical layers and autonomous and connected aerial networks, as well as AI and machine learning for wireless networks in general. And this summer, we will start a second round of workshops, not necessarily in the given order, but one workshop will be on non-terrestrial networks with an emphasis on next generation satellite networks. Um, I plan to organize this in, um, uh, in collaboration with Optical Satellite Consortium Canada later in the summer. And uh, Dr. Tesneem Darwish, uh, a postdoctoral fellow in my group will be in charge. And then another workshop on physical layer technologies for uh, 6G and Dr. Ahmed Ibrahim will be in charge of that uh, organization. And then uh, last but not least, AI machine learning analytics for 6G and Dr. Mohamed Hoshol uh, will be in charge and hopefully you will hear the announcements. So next, uh, to provide a context for this talk, as well as the coming slides in which I will allude to my own research, I start with uh, a quiz. This is what I do in uh, my undergraduate courses in general, one of the very first lectures. And the question is very simple, but the answer is mind boggling in many ways. So imagine a wireless network, a base station and a mobile phone, and assume that the mobile phone is at cell edge that is uh, quite far away from the base station, yet it has the connection. So what fraction of the transmitted energy reaches the, uh, the intended destination that is the smartphone? So an uninformed person, uh, like a student in a third or fourth year class, might think that this is just a fraction, maybe like 1% of the transmitted energy. So it's clear from the way question is casted that only a small fraction re reaches. But how small? Well, the answer is uh, a typical value uh, for cell edge path loss would be in the order of 120 dB. It might be even uh, more than that, which means that only one trillionth of the transmitted energy reaches the destination. I really cannot think of any engineering system which is more inefficient than wireless networks when it comes to coverage. Um, and then there is this big fundamental goal. And again, I am having hard time to think any uh, more fundamental research task, especially when it comes to radio based communications. And what are the efficient ways of collecting and distributing the radio signal? Once again, to provide uh, some more perspective, Keep in mind that uh, with signal processing techniques, especially in physical layer, we might get uh, a dB or a, even one quarter of a dB would be a, an important uh, achievement. But the losses are orders of magnitude bigger than um, um, uh, bigger than what you can do in uh, what you can recover in the physical layer. I shouldn't, uh, please do not uh, interpret what I am saying as I am belittling physical layer. Actually, a good chunk of my research is on physical layer. We are talking about a multi trillion dollar network worldwide. If you can come up with a tangible uh, method that will give you a quarter of a dB advantage that would translate into millions and millions of dollars. No question in that. 
but uh, I just wanted to share with you how big uh, the, the problem is in general in front of us. So uh, we have a core network, which is a more than a century old wired network, which is also evolving uh, constantly. Radio access network uh, would be the interface between user devices and the core network. Um, however, radio access networks successful operation depends on quite a number of decisions to be made. Uh, um, for instance, at what freak a user to which access point to connect at what time, at what frequency channel, with what power level using which uh, physical layer mode, all these decisions are captured through radio resource management. So in that sense, radio access network and radio resource management are tangled. If RRM is uh, inefficient, then even a, more, a very advanced radio access network uh, will not show it is true potential. So uh, throughout my career, now if I start my career from my master's, it's already 30 years, uh, you can imagine that I naturally touched upon so many research problems with my students. Nevertheless, one core theme in my research throughout the last three decades has been around this fundamental question that is the efficient ways of distributing and collecting signals in the network. Uh, my master's thesis was on distributed antenna systems that itself evolved. We call it today perhaps things like coordinated multipoint transmission reception or cloud radio access network. And here I am showing my very first paper from my master's. And then um, in the around throughout the year 2000s, that is the pre-4G era. Uh, my work was supported mainly by Nortel and Samsung from industry. And I feel myself very fortunate to be part of this, at the time, world's biggest uh, wireless transcontinental project in Europe, Wiener, which was a six framework project. Lots of good ideas were developed and a number of them found their way to LTE. And uh, notably relaying, uh, I think I, uh, I again feel myself very uh, fortunate to be uh, in a place, a right place, right time with, for instance, uh, colleagues from WWRF, Carleton University was the very first North American member of this research platform. Uh, we came up with this uh, paper, uh, which was cited in, I believe, about 150 uh, 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 patents. Uh, therefore, it had big impact to the industry. And the, the, this very first paper that I published in an obscure uh, workshop, which doesn't exist anymore, even the, I guess, transactions are not there. It is the very first paper uh, which talks about relaying in cellular communications. Uh, we looked at this concept from very different angles, had patents on this issue. And then uh, pre-5G era came, uh, that is uh, the previous decade. And my research was uh, supported by quite a number of uh, industrial partners. We also, uh, uh, I'm thankful to the Ontario government, uh, supported this, uh, one of the largest pre-standardized 5G research at the time on, on agile networks. And now in the 6G era, we are trying to position ourselves with respect to 6G standardization, which will likely happen in the second half of uh, this new, new decade. In addition to uh, my contact with industry, uh, recently, about a year ago, Carlton University became and uh, uh, founding member of Optical Satellite Communications Consortium Canada. Uh, I invite my uh, Canadian uh, audience to explore this and to be part of it if they find the value. Um, uh, and one of the big 6G research items uh, in our agenda is this integrated space aerial terrestrial network. Um, uh, nevertheless, 
this integrated architecture with several vertical layers, uh, there is research going on um, at each component uh, by itself, because as you can imagine, and it will be clear, for instance, the dynamics of networking in space is very different than that in terrestrial networks. Just for the sake of uh, completeness, I still have quite a bit of five work going on. Uh, I am a big fan of faster than Nyquist signaling, and I'm grateful to uh, Nokia Bell Labs uh, for supporting that research. Uh, we have um, a team exploring uh, that concept, as well as NOMA. Uh, today, when you say NOMA, people immediately interpret that as power domain NOMA, but there is also quite a bit of interesting work on the code domain NOMA, even mathematically much richer. Um, and another item is millimeter wave beam forming. We also, like any other active research group, try to keep an eye on all uh, novel technologies. And if we have enough sufficient expertise and if, it, if that technology is in line with our other uh, research and ours, we integrate that or we take it as a uh, project by itself. So I enjoyed uh, good collaboration with industry, which resulted in a high number of uh, patents. So that was a very quick introduction. But uh, the main point is this, actually, uh, from especially the, in the, the introduction I made on my research background, what I am talking today is not something that occurred to me last week, or I just heard a talk, or I read a paper, and I found it very interesting, and then I prepared this talk. No, I have been thinking on these concepts for 30 years. So um, uh, it, is, it is not an uh, impulsive presentation. Uh, I know that I am opinionated, uh, as you will see, um, um, but uh, my background makes me opinionated. So where we are, um, as it was clear, every about 10 years, a new generation discussion comes. It is actually a very long discussion. Take 5G, for instance. Uh, release 15, which is phase one, 5G now is out more than a year and a half ago. Release 16, that is phase two, will be out uh, to be scheduled, scheduled to be out precisely in four weeks. That is phase two. And the community is already started working on release 17, that is the 5G evolution. And indeed, 3GPP, that is the platform which kind of articulates these technologies, uh, uh, is already putting together the study items for release 18. Uh, release 18 studies will start in one year, in spring 2021. Uh, but the discussions about it is uh, outlined, if I may say, have already started. So uh, a very open-ended research in the beginning, then uh, three to five years of standardization activities. Um, um, I guess I should put it here, so standardization finished. And then there will be very intense uh, deployment. Uh, in this era, in the deployment era, that generation becomes at, in the radar screen of the consumer as well. And then slowly uh, deployments uh, uh, kind of lose momentum because the subsequent generation discussions start. So this is how the generations business work uh, as a ballpark discussion. Now, 5G discussions are everywhere, um, in not only in uh, tech sections of newspapers, but in the mainstream media, in prime time news. So people might be thinking, hey, before 5G, there was 4G and 3G and 2G. It wasn't that a big, big deal at the time. But now everyone is talking about 5G. Why is that? Well, the answer is clear. The answer is that when we say 5G, we mean much more than the smartphone. So all the vertical industries are involved. By stretch, the entire economy, uh, in one way or another, will rely on connectivity as we move forward. That is why it is extremely important, and it is extremely strategic 
Therefore, we always talk here about security and politics, and it is not accidental that President Trump last year sent this tweet that he wants uh, America to lead in 6G discussions um, the, because leadership in 5G and then 6G actually leadership, it means leadership in the world economy. Now I am moving to 6G. I just did a Google search, Google images. There are lots of artists' rendition, as you see in these pictures. So and a proper word, perhaps, is that I will be using in the rest of my talk is ultra connectivity. That is uh, the connectivity modes that require very high rates, very low latency, and the network supporting a very high number of connections in the IoT world. Um, so if we have, for instance, immersed reality type of applications, uh, you might need uh, tens of actually terahertz, sorry, terabits of second connectivity in an un, uh, uncoded mode, even after compression you might need uh, uh, around 100 gigabits per second. These devices are probably not in the market today, but it is just a matter of time. Uh, uh, mind you that we are trying to explore at least 10 years down the road. Now, the next issue as a researcher for me is the following. Well, uh, as an artist, you can have all these pictures uh, in internet even more fancy ones, but how did you build this network, right? So I want to come to this uh, access issue. And there, once again, uh, access is the job of the radio access network. And what I am showing here in the screen is um, a design goes back to perhaps Bell Labs, uh, easily 1970s, if not earlier, and this has been the uh, operational modes, mode in the first two generation. So we have the core network, you have base stations, and then there is a switch that is uh, mainly in charge of uh, things like handoff and routing. And then uh, due to the fact that the, um, the, the demand is much more than supply when it comes to spectrum, um, uh, you have to reuse your resources in the spectrum. That will result in interference, and then interference was mitigated due to through a, a static design uh, in in just the geography. Uh, users which are far away from each other were allowed to use the same uh, frequency. So this is our uh, start. Things have uh, evolved for sure. And keep in mind that as RAN becomes more and more complex, that would require more and more complex decision making, that is radio resource management, in a very fast manner. And this is getting a, a headache, a nightmare, actually. That is the true word. Uh, as we explore much more sophisticated radio access network uh, architectures. And another point is that as RAN becomes distributed, uh, radio resource management will have to be at least in part distributed because uh, it is just conceivable that there is a super duper node somewhere in the world and it makes all decisions for all connections. Even if it is possible from a computation viewpoint, the latency requirements does not allow that. So um, this presentation is supposed to be a high level one without math. And I have only, I guess, this slide, which has a little bit math. Uh, let us pay attention for a moment, only the rate side. So my key performance indicator is rate, and I want very high rates. I want gigabits per second. I want terabits per second. Where I need to invest? Where does the rate come from? Well, there are three canonical dimensions from which rate comes from. Everything else is, uh, is a helper. So once again, only three, I should make it like that for the video, only three canonical dimensions. One of them is uh, what I may say multi-layer multi MIMO, 
but in uh, plain terms, that is your antenna architecture. Better antennas, uh, multiple antennas at the transmitter and receiver, there is an opportunity to increase the late um, uh, at the limit in a linear fashion, linear in the minimum of the transmit and receive antennas. But let me put aside the rate, uh, sorry, antennas for a second. What else? The remaining two are bandwidth. If you are looking for very high rates, you need a lot of bandwidth. And then bandwidth is a potential. You should be able to convert, convert that potential into rate and that is what is called spectral efficiency. And it is unit actually tells the story. It is bits per second per hertz. That is how efficiently you can use the spectrum. And what I am giving here is what is known today as Nyquist-Shannon theorem from uh, 1940s. It is a non-constructive existence theorem. Basically, mathematically, we know that this is doable but we don't know precisely how to do that. Um, so if I just dissect this expression a little bit more, inside the logarithm, you see the received power over noise power. So to make the discussion short, in order to have high spectral efficiency, which will convert your bandwidth into high rate, you need a lot of received power, which means that for a given transmit power, if path loss is very high, if there is a lot of blockage, your received power will be low, your spectral efficiency will be low, and then your late will be low, unfortunately. Now, you might be tempted to say that, hey, wait a second. This spectral efficiency might be low, but the operator might throw more bandwidth to save you, to give you rate, that is uh, correct to some extent, uh, more rate in that sense, uh, sorry, more bandwidth will come with additional power, but let us put aside even the transmit power. More bandwidth is very expensive solution. So as soon as your spectral efficiency will be below a threshold, operator will not dare to save you, that will be too expensive. The bottom line is, if you do not have adequate signal power, you are gone, you are in outage. Now, the other side of the coin is that your spectral efficiency might be very good. You might be just in front, well, across the router or below the base station, but there is congestion, too many users. So operator is, uh, does not have enough bandwidth to allocate to you. At most, it can give only a thin slice, which will result in um, um, a, a low rate as well. Now, there is another dimension to this discussion, and that is the following. As we move forward, especially with these uh, demanding applications like XR, the disparity between applications becomes orders of magnitude uh, different in terms of rate. We will have users that require a uh, few tens of kilobits per second, and then there are users which, who require up to gigabits per second connectivity. Now, if, the con if congestion is tied to how many users are geographically, then it is an easy design because you can guess where the users will be. There will be odd users here and there, but those are odd ones. They will not result in congestion. Congestion will happen, likely happen in downtown, in uh, busy streets, and you make your wiring accordingly. But with XR, just a few users in the middle of nowhere can result in um, a big stress to the network. So you might think that you have a very dense network. So supply is there, investment is there, but the demand may not be arising precisely where you think it would be. So when there is this mismatch, you are uh, back to problem situation as long as uh, radio access network is concerned. There is, of course, a brute force solution. That solution would be put a base station everywhere so that statistically a user is always very close to a base station. So received power will be high. And then due to reuse, uh, 
congestion will be will not be a big big deal. The catch is that this extremely dense network architecture is only possible when there are likely users to pay for that infrastructure. So it is okay to do this in indoors, in campus environments, in downtown environments, but it is not scalable. That is the issue. We have this scalability problem now. I can provide you 6G, let us say, hypothetically, ultra connectivity in Carlton campus or in my home, that is doable, but if you want it pretty much everywhere, we, we have a problem. So um, I would like to actually talk a little bit more about this connectivity challenge because there are different cases which require different uh, solution techniques. And I am starting from the easy one. The easy one is that there is no connectivity. This would be the case in uh, sparsely populated areas and remote areas. It is easy because you just uh, use, let us say, a satellite technology, and uh, that, will, that will do the job, although it may not be optimal in, in some way. And today, when we talk about non-terrestrial networks, uh, like uh, SpaceX, Starlink, and so on, still much of the attention is in this uh, sparsely populated areas, unprivileged areas. You might be hearing a lot of discussion about the next 3 billion unconnected, things of that sort. So that makes me actually to think uh, whether this next generation architecture with SpaceX and uh, similar initiatives will be successful or not. This is a very important discussion item that I will come back later. Because at the end of the day, uh, the business model results in the success or failure. Yes, with these very dense uh, satellite constellations, you can provide connectivity to almost any single location outdoors on the globe. But if there are not enough subscribers to pay for them, or economically, if they are not ready to pay, although the population is there, perhaps parts of Africa, then the business case will not be there. You won't be able to make money. Let us move on. Another interesting case is even more interesting. Now I have infrastructure, yet I have poor connectivity because I am just outside the, uh, the core populated areas. And this is not a hypothetical situation. This is very real. This is me on this train on August 8th last year, going from Ottawa to Toronto. And there was a mechanical problem. Train was going slowly. And I was checking my smartphone. And would you imagine that in Canada, a G8 country, one of the most developed countries on the planet, from the capital, to the biggest city, a good chunk of the railroad, I cannot have cellular signal. So we are talking about 6G today. And the, the facts on the ground is that even 2G does not exist in, uh, I'm not talking about Northern Canada, between Toronto and Ottawa. And this is me again at Globcom 2010-19 in Hawaii. Um, and uh, from my hotel room, it's a big hotel, big compound, there is only 2.5G edge connection. I, I, I was even surprised to see an old edge network. So once again, we talk about 6G and many of the networks, if you are outside those campus areas and so on, um, are um, kind, they cannot provide the high super connectivity we are aiming for. Next, even more interesting, now you are in urban areas, but still there will be poor ultra connectivity. So now I am shifting the discussion to ultra connectivity because if you are talking about just SMS, that's not a big deal. Keep in mind that connectivity is a function of rate. So for a given received power, as rate increased, EB, that is the energy per bit, would be rate, sorry, 
power received over rate. So you might have uh, some nominal received power, but as rate increases, that would be the case in XR or 4K video streaming, you will run into connectivity problems again. And then um, uh, uh, just the congestion side, for a variety of reasons, uh, as I explained, there will be an atypically high demand with very unpredictable uh, traffic patterns. Therefore, there will be this supply-demand mismatch, and you will have uh, ultra-connectivity. Now, um, yeah, uh, just I will come back to this point. So we have many situations, once again. The least interesting one is number one, because uh, I can solve it today. But as we move to number two, number three, number four, the solution is getting increasingly uh, difficult and expensive. The radio access network and uh, uh, supporting RRM techniques have been um, getting more advanced throughout the decades. And like many of you in the bridge, I have also worked in many of these enhancements, whether it is distributed antenna systems or cell breathing or beam forming and so on. But the issue is that no matter what we do, the user expectation and user's reliance on connectivity, we never catch up. Users are becoming more and more dependent on the connectivity. Now it is not a luxury item anymore. For health reasons, for driving reasons, we need uninterrupted, almost ubiquitous ultra connectivity. So, now let us talk about this integrated space aerial terrestrial network architecture. This picture shows the situation today in a metro area or even uh, in the near future, we have uh, uh, macro cells and various types of small cells, even technologies like CRAM, COMP, so on and so forth. And today we have also satellite networks actually not only today, for decades. The big point here is that satellite networks are orthogonal to terrestrial networks. Uh, they use different air interface. Um, they, uh, they do not rely on the radio access network on the ground. Um, uh, it is a different equipment, so on and so forth. What is advocated actually in this new paradigm of non-terrestrial networks is a vertical heterogeneous network architecture with multiple uh, layers. The terrestrial layer will continue to evolve regardless, but we will have other layers. Uh, in this order in the picture, first we will have or we might have a UAV mounted base stations. So these are moving base stations, moving in 3D, um, and due to the restrictions in uh, UAV height, they will be up to 100 or 200 meters above the ground. And then there are high altitude platforms are either like very large fixed wing structures or uh, balloons or Zeppelin type of structures. And these are way above actually, uh, they are at around 20 kilometers above the ground level. And to just give a context, airplanes, even the transatlantic planes, go around uh, 10 kilometers above the ground le level. So th this is these high altitude platform stations are at stratosphere. And one important aspect is they are almost stationary. They are actually moving, but with some small uh, uh, movement they can be look like stationary for an Earth observer. So if you are here on the ground in Ottawa, your high altitude uh, platform, if that is the desire of the operator, would be just on top of you. Then comes uh, uh, low Earth orbit satellites, uh, sometimes uh, based on their altitude, uh, people differentiate between very low Earth orbit and low Earth orbit 
in this presentation, I am using them interchangeably. So these are about 350 kilometer up to 2,000 kilometer about the ground level. Uh, this is, for instance, uh, SpaceX's uh, Starlink constellation with thousands of them envisioned. One big issue is that due to their uh, altitude, they are in space and they have to orbit. Um, and uh, their orbital speed is different than Earth's rotational speed, which means that uh, they are moving with respect to an Earth observer. Therefore, lots of challenges come with that movement. Um, and then at the fifth layer, uh, these are the newer versions of the older geo-Earth orbit satellites. They are at an altitude, at a very precise altitude, so that their orbital speed coincides with Earth's rotational speed, such that although they are moving for an Earth observer, they look stationary. Um, therefore, today, if you have uh, satellite internet, you put your dish looking at a particular angle uh, to a geo-Earth orbit satellite. The next generation of these are sometimes referred to as HTS, high throughput uh, uh, satellites. So let us move on. Um, I have a set of remarks on the architecture. Architecture, the access architecture, which is uh, essentially maybe synonymous to radio access network, it is probably the most uh, important and fundamental construct uh, of uh, these wireless networks. And uh, you cannot change that quickly. It is not like a software update. It is a uh, tremendous investment. And actually, evolutions in the access architecture are, uh, they do not jive well, they do not align well, I should say, with generations. So uh, when we say 5G to 6G, generally we refer to important big changes in the air interface, in the signal processing aspects, but uh, a particular type of access network might be there serving several generations. So today's discussion has relevance to 5G because 5G, once it is deployed, will be operational for easily two decades. Um, it is uh, relevant to envision 6G and even beyond. Now, when we are discuss discussing the access network architecture, this is very much a cost-dependent discussion. You might have a number of alternatives, and one of them might be an engineering marvel, but at the end of the day, you need a business case, which means that the most economic alternative wins, although it may not turn out to be the most uh, beautiful one. However, this uh, cost issue is very time dependent. So a particular technology might be uh, ruled out at a particular time because it is expensive, but there might be disruptive developments in that technology and cost might come down and then that might become a viable choice in a future uh, generation discussion. Actually, this is what we are seeing with uh, satellites. Satellites were very expensive, but uh, cost is coming down very rapidly. Um, this fourth point is also extremely important and this is something I already said. Today, the user is very uh, forgiving when we have some connectivity issues to the extent that if the application is like um, um, uh, video streaming, if you lose a fraction of a second the link, you may not even understand. Because at the, at the other side, uh, there is a user. User is by default very... Uh, human person is often very forgiving, especially when it comes to leisure type of applications. But when we talk about uh, machinery, factory floor, or actually even applications like XR, um, or you know, autonomous driving that relies on connectivity, then uh, 
you are uh, really dependent on connectivity in an existential manner. Imagine a self-driving vehicle and then it loses connectivity 1%, even a fraction of a percent. Uh, you know the consequences. So the, the thing is, we have a very fast increasing reliance on connectivity. Therefore, future designs will have to take this into consideration. Now, a parenthetical remark, I am not sure how much I will have time to dwell on this, and that is the following. Our uh, mode of operation for the last 10, sorry, 100 years when we are talking about wireless has been almost always radio. Why? Radio means coverage. You put a base station, there are reflections everywhere, the radio signal penetrates from outdoors to indoors and so on, you attain good coverage. But as we talk more and more about aerial communications, space communications, in most cases, we might have point-to-point -point links. Consider two UA UAVs in the air or two uh, SpaceX satellites. So when that is the case, there is actually no reason to use radio, which is very inefficient, as we discussed earlier. Uh, energy spreads to everywhere, even if you use a directional antenna. A good alternative is, in line of sight dominated channels, is to resort to laser-based communications, that is free space optical. So FSO will play uh, a very important role in the wireless access network architecture to the extent that I sometimes do not use anymore the well-established term RAN, radio access network, because it has radio in it. But uh, some of the connections in the future, I think, will increasingly will become um, uh, FSO-based. And then, although I am continuously making remarks about the access network. Actually, the distinction between access network and core network is getting fuzzier and fuzzier. In 2G networks like GSM, access and core were very separate, but now, especially with the upcoming mobile edge computing, fog computing, uh, network slicing technologies, um, in many ways, core network and access network are tangled. Keep that in mind as well. So the situation is getting even more complex and perhaps interesting. And my final point before moving on, uh, although now I am making a reference to connectivity, but this is a very loaded word. We are not talking about only communications anymore like in the old days. Uh, this discussion has other elements. For instance, computing. Um, imagine tomorrow, like 10 years, 15 years down the road, you have a lightweight uh, augmented reality goggle or uh, uh, device. It, it will be inconceivable to have that 100 gram device you are wearing, and then you are carrying a two kilogram computer in your backpack uh, to support the computing requirement of your XR. So a lot of computing of loading to the cloud will be necessary, but the cloud cannot be too far away due to latency requirements. Therefore, we are talking about this mobile edge computing and fog computing. In short, we might be putting an access point for computing purposes, for computing of loading, rather than primarily for communications. This is very interesting. We never did this before, but the time has come. And then there is the content issue, caching, uh, again, due to latency issue, we might want to bring lots of um, um, core network functionalities uh, close to the devices, and then privacy and security. All of these are uh, very important discussions uh, in the framework of uh, connectivity. 
So one other view diagram, uh, which is from a JSAC paper we co-authored last year, making a case for this integrated space aerial terrestrial network. Uh, once again, we have multiple layers. Uh, I call this in, in my recent papers, vertical headnet, uh, terrestrial layers and drone base stations and high altitude platforms. But there is another element in this picture, which is also very important. That is in addition to nodes in the air and space, which provide connectivity, there will be nodes which require connectivity. Those are uh, UAVs for a variety of purposes. First and foremost, in, uh, in delivery, cargo drones, uh, even to provide them service, you would need this uh, connectivity in 3D. So the discussion is getting even more interesting. Now, I talked about quite many interesting things, satellites and high altitude platforms and so on. Some of you might be wondering, are these new things? Is satellite technology new? High altitude platform, is this new? The answer is actually no. These are very old technologies. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is this now seminal paper, I think rediscovered not too long ago, exist uh, from 1940s. Uh, a British researcher is contemplating whether rockets like satellites can give uh, worldwide coverage. And then uh, it is already how many decades? Six, more than six decades ago, the first satellite was launched. Um, and interestingly, satellite networks have never been a success for providing uh, connectivity for user terminal in general, except for the cases where there is no other alternative, like when you are in an oil rig offshore or in a uh, you know sailing or uh, you know in a national park in Canada. And when we come to high altitude platforms, they also have quite a bit of history. The, the very first ones, once again, go back to uh, Bell Labs, tried in 1960s, very interestingly. Canada uh, Communications Research Center at some point, well, quite a while ago, 1987, had uh, this uh, high profile uh, project on high altitude platforms. And even things like Google Loon, no matter how exciting they sound, that has a history of 10 years and SpaceX has a history of five years. So given that pretty much everything I said, there is a rich history behind and actually not very successful to be added. What is new in this picture? I think that is a very fair question. Now, before uh, throwing my two cents to that discussion, just let me open a parenthesis. Uh, parenthesis. So here in this abstract picture, I am showing returns due to uh, in some key performance indicators from a technology with respect to time. Some technologies evolve uh, rather slowly, like battery technologies. Some others quite fast, like processing technologies. Nevertheless. I know the slope and I can make predictions and planning accordingly. But if this shape is in a hockey stick manner, then the story becomes very interesting. And this is what is happening in, in satellites as well as drones and so on. So, um, you know, just last weekend, the very first time a commercial uh, 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 spacecraft was launched with human cargo. It is a big uh, step, actually. Uh, so the players are changing uh, in this domain. Uh, uh, launching a satellite is becoming very inexpensive. Uh, SpaceX, in every launch today, puts uh, about 60 LEO satellites in, in just uh, one mission. Um, and then just take the example of drones. Uh, 
um, I was talking to a faculty member who has been doing research in drones for a number of years. He was saying that just 10, 15 years ago, when we did a project, we purchased a drone. It was as expensive as a new car. Today, if you give pay just $1,000, you get a very uh, high-end drone. So the price came down at least an order of magnitude, perhaps even two orders of magnitude. So keep this in mind. These technologies, which were very prohibitive until uh, uh, not too long ago, are becoming increasingly affordable. So the cost is coming down. And on the other side, as I mentioned several times, the user need for connectivity or ultra connectivity everywhere pretty much is increasing and increasing. At some point, these will touch. And at that, when they touch, you will have customers to pay for these technologies and there will be a business case. So once again, the answer to uh, the success of an integrated satellite and aerial network really depends on the business case. Now, I am often asked the following interesting question. There is big um, hype about, for instance, these next generation Leos. Uh, Amazon has, Google has, all of them have projects, not only SpaceX. Will they be successful? My take is 50-50. So uh, there is uh, only 50%, or let us make it 51. Uh, let us look at it from an, as an up, up, from a favorable glass lens. Uh, I would like to see them successful, but uh, there are two hurdles. One of them, some of the technological components are not sufficiently advanced, primarily uh, laser and photonic signal processing technologies, which are very important on board, and free space optical, still there are lots of challenges, especially uh, you want to use that within the presence of atmosphere. Um, and also machine learning will be a critical enabler, and we don't have sufficiently advanced AI yet. Um, and the second issue, the second concern is, so the first concern about the next generation space networks is, uh, in my view, uh, technology still needs uh, more advances. And the second issue is uh, the business case, because uh, we hear over and over again from most of these initiatives that they are targeting uh, not the metro areas, not the populated areas, but sparse areas and less privileged uh, populations. So unless there is big sub subsidization, subsidizing by governments and so on, uh, the revenue may not be there. However, this shouldn't be seen as a negative comment. Um, we have actually 10 years in front of us to do foundational research in this area to make this paradigm a success in what I call next, next generation, NNG. That is the discussion around 2030. So in 2030, 6G standards will be out and 6G uh, will be developed again uh, in a favorable prediction uh, with uh, space and aerial components native to the air interface. Please uh, uh, pay attention to this word of native. So uh, 5G standard is out yet. Space communication has not been native to 5G when it was developed. But there is an opportunity in 6G that it can be native, which means that uh, satellites can use 6G air interface as well as high altitude platforms, so on and so forth. So um, once again, there is a big research opportunity in front of the research community. Now, uh, once again, I would like to differentiate between two different bulk of scenarios. The first bulk is when we talk about uh, 
uh, UAV base stations and high altitude platforms and satellites, there is a fu fundamental question. And that question is, is there a terrestrial network present or not? If terrestrial network is not present, then all these new nodes are rather straightforward. Therefore, today even airplanes and cruise ships and so on uh, can have service by high altitude platforms and so on. But the situation gets complicated and interesting when we need the integration problem. Really, integration is the key word. So you have the terrestrial network, you have to integrate to this need, uh, new network some unprecedented type of nodes. And it is just more than a base station moving. Keep in mind that in our network, base station never moves. We talk about mobile network, it is the user which is moving. And if one user moves from one area to another, you do a handoff on user basis. But now I am talking about a base station moving. If base station has 100 users, you have a very different handoff situation. You have to do that quickly for 100 users. And the backhaul from that base station to the core network is wireless as well. Uh, lots of challenges come with that. Interference is a very big problem. So lots of problems, which is good news for uh, technical community. Lots of research is necessary. Now, again, let me make a big distinction between two cases. God forbid, there is a disaster. Terrestrial network is not operational. Google sends it is loon, balloon, and then provides uh, connectivity through LTE, air interface. No big deal. It happened in, I think, 2017 or 18 in Katrina and so on. But look at the following example. You are in, it is 2030. You are in downtown Ottawa, or I am in downtown Ottawa. Um, uh, and I, I am wearing an XR device which requires 100 uh, megabits per second connectivity. Therefore, I am getting my signal from a nearby small cell in a line of sight environment. Then a truck passes by and there is a red light truck uh, blocks the signal. There is 30 dB attenuation. Suddenly spectral efficiency goes down very substantially and 100 megabits per second is not feasible anymore. So for that 10, 20 uh, second period, I need to do a handoff to an aerial base station, either a drone or high altitude platform or a satellite. And once the truck is away, I make a handoff very quickly back to um, uh, the small cell. Can you do that? So it is a big, big challenge um, uh, in, in this overly sophisticated network. Um, I think I uh, try to convince you about the importance of this enrichment in the network architecture, and it is already more than an hour, uh, and I am on the, only halfway through, actually remaining uh, the last one third of my slides are kind of reference, I will leave them to you. Uh, just let me use another 15 minutes and 5 p.m. my time, uh, I, will, I will actually uh, stop. So, Today, there are about, about just over 2,000 satellites uh, active and only maybe less than 1,000 of them or even less. I'm not sure about the actual figure are for communications. Uh, but I anticipate that just in about a decade, the number of satellites will increase uh, an order of magnitude easily. Everyone now knows about these LEOs uh, just to the less informed uh, audience, even this picture is not to the scale. Earth's uh, radius is about 6,000 kilometers, and a LEO satellites might be anywhere from 300 kilometers to 2,000 kilometers. So if it is 300 kilometers, it is 120th of the radius. So it, it should be right here where my cursor is. 
And then in contrast, geosatellites have to be in this particular altitude, which is about seven times the radius. So it is actually much above. Um, uh, LEO satellites have been around for a long time, actually, but due to the cost, um, people are giving this technology a new chance because they can be deployed in very high numbers, therefore the term mega constellation. And let us look at the advantages of a LEO with respect to geo satellites. Uh, first and foremost, the footprint is small, therefore the throughput is much higher. Geo satellites are not generally used for connect, uh, like browse, internet browsing and so on. Uh, their footprint is a quarter of the globe there is too much data requirement there. So the primary use case is broadcasting, video pro uh, TV, for instance, for geosatellites. But for internet connectivity, LEOs uh, might be a choice. So they are close to Earth, therefore latency is within reason and uh, launching becomes uh, uh, cheaper. And then when we say actually constellation, Often what we refer is that these satellites, there is connectivity between them. So if a signal is transmitted or to be sent from Ottawa to Buenos Aires in this picture, it may bypass the uh, terrestrial network altogether. So a LEO satellite after a few hops, a few relays, uh, the signal might be pushed back to uh, uh, the vicinity of the user terminal. Let me just uh, pass this slide. And these are, again, some nice pictures from internet, but these are becoming real, whether you think about uh, the Cooper constellation of uh, Blue Origin owned by Jeff Bezos or uh, Starlink owned by SpaceX. We are talking about a huge number of satellites in thousands or even tens of thousands of them uh, in multiple shells at different uh, altitudes. Um, for instance, look at, uh, this is again some view diagrams from SpaceX. Um, uh, here, 60 satellites are stacked into a rocket and when they are launched, they unfold for energy harvesting from the sun and so on. Very interesting. Now, in this figure, I am just showing, I don't know how many are, let us say 20 satellites. Um, and you see that uh, you can imagine that we might have a routing issue, but then imagine 10,000 of them moving at different orbits. Um, the, you have a real uh, routing problem. IP protocol problem, addressing problem. Well, problem is again a, a double-edged word. I, I like problems because it is a research challenge, right, uh, for us. So there is a lot to be sorted out. And today, much of the knowledge of uh, SpaceX and so on are uh, proprietary. We really do not have much literature what is going on in regards to their modes of operation. However, there are some issues uh, some shortcomings, uh, some commercial challenges with respect to LEOs as well. Now, one of them is that since a LEO satellite moves with respect to the Earth observer, um, I think, for instance, uh, six minutes is a typical time by the time it rises at the horizon and it dies, uh, there is a need for frequent handovers, which is not good in any network. Um, in geosatellite, you know, there is no need for a handoff. So tracking is an issue. And um, uh, once again, in geosatellite, remember, you put your satellite dish at a particular orientation, that's it. How do you uh, track the satellite? If you would do that with beam forming, with electronic steering of a beam, that is expensive. Just for your reference, today's smartphones, no matter how advanced they are, and no matter how much literature we have on um, beam steering, they don't steer beams. So that technology is not there in your smartphone. It is expensive. It is 
uh, expensive from energy viewpoint as well. It will drain your battery. So all of these results in expensive ground stations. And with today's technology, direct Leo to user equipment link like a smartphone is difficult unless it is a low rate application. If it is an SMS type of application, that is okay, link budget will suffice. But if we are talking about high rate internet, that is difficult today. Um, um, and another interesting point that uh, uh, misses many people's attention, which was brought to my attention by uh, a colleague uh, in, in, in a company, and that is the following. Since these satellites uh, have to orbit LEOs, most of the time, most of them are on unpopulated areas, on the ocean, for instance. So if the prime customer base is in the US, only a fraction of time, uh, uh, basically the satellites are on top of US. So the, the capacity as well as investment for that matter is wasted. Uh, I will just make another parenthetical remark. There is some very recent literature, and this paper is from just uh, literally a few months ago. One of the uh, world's leading experts in networking from University College London, Professor Handley, uh, in, uh, in an ACM workshop, um, uh, it is about uh, low latency wide area routing through mega constellations. Um, so today, if you use terrestrial network in a long haul from, let us say, London, UK to Johannesburg in the tip of uh, Africa, that round trip delay is close to 200 milliseconds. Um, that is due to the speed of light in fiber. And it is, here is the point, it is 50 per, up to 50%, or it is, I believe the uh, speed of light in fiber is two thirds of the speed of light in vacuum. So as soon as you use uh, 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 inter-satellite links, it is 50% faster than in, in propagation delay than the terrestrial links. On top of that, the terrestrial links are not point to point. So even it is from, there is a, you can draw a line from London to Johannesburg, but due to where the routers are, the signal might be traversing a longer path. So to make the long story short, if you use multi-hop LEOs, that is uh, about half, the, you cut back the round trip delay time to half. And then if you use some earth relays, that the number comes down uh, even more. So let me close the parentheses and go to move on to something else that I find extremely exciting and very little in comparison literature exists. And these are high altitude platform stations, sometimes referred to as high altitude pseudo satellites. You, you, I am sure many of you must have heard about uh, Google's or Alphabet's Loom project, but there are other high profile projects like Airbus's Zephyr and Thales's Stratobos uh, project all of them are uh, positioned around 20 kilometers. And when I say they are, uh, Loon is operational, but Zephyr and Stratobos, uh, these are just concept and tests at the moment. Uh, I am not aware of commercial uh, deployment for the other two. And um, um, hubs are very interesting due to a number of reasons. One of them, since they are only 20 kilometers uh, away from uh, the, the ground and in outdoors line of sight links are possible, therefore link budget is much more favorable in comparison to, uh, to a LEO satellite. Just let us do a quick calculation. Even if we assume a LEO satellite if you assume a LEO satellite at 2,000 kilometers, there is a uh, two orders of magnitude difference in distance. And then if, even if we take the free space path loss of two, that will make a 40 dB difference in path loss. 
So if you have a received signal 40 dB higher, of course, uh, spectral efficiency will be high and you can have possibly uh, very fast uh, uh, high-speed internet. Next, these are almost geostationary. That is no wasted capacity due to orbiting. There is no tracking issue, no handovers, and their footprints are much smaller, which means that throughput is much, much higher. What I mean is area throughput. And uh, due to the proximity, the round trip delay is often a, frac a fraction of a millisecond. So even ultra low latency applications are feasible with high altitude platforms, which wouldn't likely feasible with uh, LEOs. I am uh, developing a separate keynote uh, in about a month uh, or at the end of this. Well, actually, it will be on July 1st. Uh, in World Wireless Research Forum meeting number 44. It says Copenhagen, but it will be virtual due to circumstances. In my group, recent in the last year, we did a lot of hubs research, and our work is uh, in review or um, uh, to be submitted. So uh, about a month ago, uh, we submitted this magazine paper, An Intelligent Vertical uh, headnet architecture, a vision of self-evolving networks. Here we are making a case of AI or emphasizing the importance of AI in these uh, vertical multi-layer networks. So what we call a self-evolving network is the next step in self-organizing network paradigm. And then just a couple of weeks ago, another magazine paper submitted and that is aerial platforms with reconfigurable smart surfaces for 5G and beyond. Um, uh, just a very quick remark there, uh, re reconfigurable smart surfaces, they often require big areas. And uh, these high altitude platform stations uh, are big. So it might be like a large building. So there is a lot of real estate as such, uh, very suitable. Uh, well, it is a visionary work, of course, to be a lot of to be seen. And then uh, we are about to prepare a paper, uh, submit, sorry, uh, it is just uh, in editing high altitude platform stations for uh, as super macro base stations for next generation wireless networks. I have a few slides about this construct and we are preparing actually, presumably the most comprehensive both survey and uh, visionary paper on the subject matter, a vision for high altitude platform stations in next next generation wireless networks. Uh, we plan to put these papers in archive, or if you are interested, I can send a copy. And I should mention that ITU uh, is a believer in high altitude platforms in the very recent World Radio Conference that took place in uh, 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 Sharm el Sheikh, right, in, in Egypt in December. Uh, 600 megahertz of spectrum is released for next generation high altitude platform applications. Um, again, I consumed my 15 minutes, but give me another 15 minutes. Uh, it's already past midnight in Turkey, and I don't know, it's, I guess, 1.30 a.m. in Iran. I, I see connections from Iran. Um, but those of you who can stay, I will just go 15 more minutes. So in this next set of slides, I will be trying to position uh, cellular networks and satellite networks in different era or phases. The first phase corresponds to the uh, 1, 2, 3G, 1, 2, 3, 4G era, basically uh, not an interesting time because satellite networks and cellular networks were two separate networks. And satellite networks themselves were uh, mainly composed of uh, isolated satellites. So this is important, isolated, meaning that two satellites even don't talk to each other. And each satellite works in what is often referred to as bandpipe mode. So a gateway uh, transmits the, let us say, uh, 
uh, TV station uh, signal to the satellite, and then it really is a amplify and forward relay, some sort of, uh, it, it covers a large area. And in ITU, these two camps are very separate. They really didn't talk to each other much until when we came to 4G, uh, uh, 4G era and the 5G standardization era, which is just finishing, which is wrapping up. So if we look at now release 14, 15, 16, uh, which again, release 16 for reference will be out in four weeks. There is a lot of talk and referencing to integration issue, um, um, but uh, not in a native way, I should uh, mention that as well. So within ITU and with dif within different platforms like WWRF, 3GPP community and the legacy satellite community are engaged and they are interested in engagement. That is important. They see value in integration and uh, talking to each other. So who are the players? Well, I guess most of you in the bridge are from, like me, uh, communications background. So this is the familiar territory for us, like operators, Verizon, China Mobile, TELUS, and so on, Turkcell, um, and the equipment providers, Ericsson, Huawei, Nokia, and so on. And there is a different ecosystem in the legacy satellite uh, domain, and those would be like Iridium, Telesat, and things of that sort. So this second phase is also, uh, we are just at the end of that. Now the story is getting very interesting. It started getting interesting, and this is my third phase. So this third phase is the time uh, where we will see 5G deployments everywhere. 5G will be on the ground, if I may say. And at some point, we will be making 6G discussions. So um, here's something interesting happening. Uh, and in my terminology, I call this next generation space uh, or satellite networks. Um, and uh, I would put, for instance, uh, Starlink into this uh, domain because they will be operational in the next few years. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, still it seems that the short-term goal at least is sparsely populated segments uh, and it is more about ubiquitous coverage throughout the world, internet to everyone. And Still, uh, Leo to UE link is not within discussions to a great extent. So how the discussions go is that Leo connected to an access point and then the signal is distributed through an access point when, we, when it comes to <coughs> uh, ultra connectivity. There is a very interesting observation here. A number of players, or the most prominent players in this uh, in this new era, next generation networks, um, are not from the legacy satellite industry. Yes, Telesat is there, but there is also Star SpaceX. Amazon is big uh, player. I am a believer in their Cooper uh, constellation. Google is is a player there, um, and then these companies are neither on the 3GPP ecosystem, and they are also not part of the, uh, the legacy satellite ecosystem. And they are not very much interested in engagement. So they, their thinking is that, look, as, as long as ITU gives us uh, the bandwidth, the spectrum, I, I really don't need much the terrestrial big network. I don't need to talk to uh, 3GPP guys or other involved people. Um, and then the most interesting era is, I think, uh, we will observe uh, in 2030s. And here the difference is that we are not talking only about sparsely populated areas, but uh, air and satellite 
networking will be giving service to metro areas there where the money is. So from a business case point, this densely populated areas to be in your customer pool is very important. Once again, today, the two segments are different. If you are in the populated areas, you are served by legacy operators. If you are in Algonquin Park, let us say in Canada, in a remote park, then you are served with uh, maybe Iridium Constellation with a different device. But once there is tight integration, then 7 billion, 8 billion people will be a customer. Not only satellites, but also high altitude platforms in the picture. Another interesting question, who will be the key players? As I will allude in my next uh, slides, I expect that there will be a big revolution in retail industry. So if I had money, I would have invested in Amazon or Alibaba in China or Rakuten in Japan. These are the mega retailers. I have reasons to think that um, these retailers would get into connectivity business and they may want to become global service providers. And if that happens, even if it is Google, for instance, it is different than uh, Tel and Bellas in Canada and all the other conventional operators around the world. So I expect in the next 10 years, there will be big disruption in the commercial ecosystem to the extent that probably this will be the biggest disruption the wireless networks have ever seen since uh, the beginning, uh, let us say, uh, 1980s. So let us move to the second deck uh, of an interesting scenario, <clears throat> let us say around 2030. And this is my case for what I call high altitude platform station mega constellations. Now, if, uh, if uh, SpaceX is talking about real mega constellations, why shouldn't be there hubs mega constellations, thousands of them uh, above Europe or China or, uh, or North America giving service to uh, uh, to areas? And I will, I will, uh, I will uh, uh, inform uh, from my perspective. So, uh, uh, Salama, if you hear me, please not. Okay, thank you. Uh, but I understand that there is again an echo problem. So I will stop sharing for a second and we'll go to the bridge and I will ask all of you, if possible, to put yourself in mute. Let us see, I see uh, Kyla not on mute. Kyla, please uh, put yourself on mute. Um, and pretty much everyone else is uh, on mute. So, uh, um, uh, uh, Salama is there. Oh, so, Salama wrote me that there is no echo on his side. Uh, it's good now. Isaac, can you also type me uh, from the chat? Is there an echo, su substantial uh, echo? I think it's good now. Uh, Okay, so yes, I guess uh, uh, one friend just put uh, herself or himself in echo. So that is good. Let us go back to the slides. And yes, um, so here is my third revolution in retail industry idea. The very quickly, first revolution happened when, when big stores came and the corner stores disappeared maybe 50 years ago, 70 years ago in the developed world and maybe 30 years ago in countries like Turkey. Um, and uh, the second revolution was when, um, uh, when online shopping started about 10 years ago. 
So uh, that had even big impact in mega retailers, uh, um, you know, the storyline. Um, and therefore, today, even the traditional retailers uh, like Costco and so on, they have all online delivery. Um, and this online experience will increase, uh, enhance more and more with better user interface and holograms and virtual reality goggles, as you can imagine. But as it became apparent more during this pandemic era that no matter how, how much online uh, shopping experience uh, enhances, there is a big bottleneck and that is the delivery. So you shop online, but it comes next day to your door uh, in the very best scenario. Actually, even in the pandemic, there was 10 days waiting time in the beginning, as many of you might have experienced. So the solution is certainly robot-based delivery, or either from terrestrial, in a terrestrial manner, but more likely through cargo drones. So here is my picture, year 2030, for instance. Um, uh, Amazon comes and uh, has a big retail rare super warehouse in greater Toronto area serving a radius of, let us say, 50 kilometers. And then I made the calculation, if every home in that radius requires only one single delivery per day, and that is not much, including postal and everything, um, and uh, Anyhow, that will require, that would mean about 10,000 cargo drones only from Amazon warehouse in the skies of GTA. Now, you may find this number outrageous, but I will tell you that just a few, like, uh, look at uh, um, uh, terrestrial traffic, right, at some point, um, uh, maybe 50 years ago, there were not this many vehicles on the ground. And this will happen much quicker when it comes to uh, UAVs. And uh, a lot of know-how from connected and autonomous vehicle domain will be, I guess, used in these uh, controlling aerial vehicles, uh, so uh, platooning and so on. But the, let us leave those stuff aside at the interest of time. The, bottle, the bottom line is, at some point, thousands and thousands of uh, drones in the air. So how do you give connectivity to these, uh, uh, these flying robots? Well, you can rely on the terrestrial network. This is a recent paper, uh, uh, a research done by Ericsson researchers. So uh, this diagram is showing the coverage of these access points uh, if you are uh, on the ground level, or let us say one meter above the ground, because uh, coverage is good. Uh, it is not, of course, regular due to obstructions. The point is that the base station's antenna patterns are engineered and antennas are tilted in such a way that it gives coverage to the ground users. If you are in the air, then the coverage becomes very patchy. So look at when you are 300 meters up, uh, it is really terrible uh, the way with the network today. Of course, we can have a dedicated terrestrial network to give aerial coverage, but another alternative here is a high altitude platform. So why not to put a high altitude platform station perhaps on top of a GTA area? It will have a free space optical based backhaul to, uh, to a gateway. And then it will be connected it is, we are talking about a mega constellation, other high altitude platforms in Montreal uh, and other regions, as well as to the Leo constellation. Um, so um, Amazon might be actually in this business of putting the hubs because they want to serve their fleet, their network. Just I'm changing uh, the discussion a little bit here. Uh, if we think about massive MIMO, as an enabling upcoming technology, which is coming, of course, very strong in the 5G era and 6G era with millimeter waves and so on. 
uh, it is possible to have very narrow beams and push the capacity where the users are. But as soon as you put the massive MIMO within city clutter, due to obstructions, line of sight is lost and it is not as beautiful as uh, you have massive MIMO in an open uh, structure. How about having massive MIMO at a high altitude platform station? And if the signal processing and energy requirements will not be sufficient to realize a massive MIMO in a single HAPS, why not to have a couple of HAPS in a mini cloud, uh, say a couple of kilometers apart, which are connected, interconnected with super high, uh, several tens of terabits per second links, and then we have a distributed massive MIMO in the sky. And as an air interface, we might have 5G, 6G, 7G based on when this might be realized. And once that architecture is there, I am not only serving uh, uh, cargo drones, it can be used for many reasons, including backhauling small cells or uh, giving service to 3D users. And then once I have this big investment and infrastructure, why not I put some processing capabilities in the sense of caching and mobile edge com computing? In effect, I am trying to realize a distributed data center here. Um, and then this will be again connected to other mini clouds in Montreal and elsewhere. The bottom line is this is basically the theme of the paper hopefully submitted next week to Communications Magazine. We are talking about aerial super macro base stations and data centers. Um, then very quickly, I will talk about finally the aerial base station and then uh, finish the discussion. Um, this figure, what I am showing, this slide is from precisely five years ago from a tutorial I delivered in ICC 2015 in, in, in UK, in London. So here what I am saying is that assume you invested in a very dense architecture and what I am showing on the right hand side is the spectral efficiency map. If you are close to an access point, if access point is here in this area, very high spectral efficiency, but the demand is fluid, unpredictable, it might uh, result in regions, let us say here, where your spectral efficiency is low. So what can we do? And in that tutorial, I came up with 10 techniques towards an agile network architecture and many of them from today's perspective, legacy techniques, whether it is uh, intercell load balancing or cell switch off or using multiple radio access technologies like Wi-Fi and cellular, multi-op links, so on and so forth. But for the first time in a public speech, I said that, well, another possibility is to bring the network closer to you. So in this picture, this doesn't, this is a, the problem is the demand is dynamic, yet the supply is static. Why not we make even the supply uh, dynamic by moving base stations? And I pushed for drone base station idea. Um, um, and at the time this was uh, uh, considered as an academic fantasy by many people. But uh, I'm very pleased that in just five years, 3GPP embraced this idea. And now the concept of UXMB is part of release 17 documents. Uh, it became for the first time, it made an entry to 3GPP world in January, 2020. And uh, the idea there, uh, well, at least the vision has been this on demand capacity in injection in an opportunistic manner for supply demand mismatch. Again, you have a dense network, but your XR user is here. So if uh, the economics allow, if that user is ready to pay, I can bring a drone base station there and provide that connectivity to that user. So uh, in the early days of this area, which 
was uh, very novel just five years ago. We did quite a bit of work. Some of our original work has been very well received on 3D drone placement. Um, and by the way, all of my groups and my collaborators' work is available at this URL, um, all our publications and even soft copies. Um, well, a, an aerial base station is, of course, different than a terrestrial base station's base station in obvious ways and less obvious ways. The obvious ones are aerial base station is moving. It needs a wireless backhaul. It doesn't have a fixed energy source. Therefore, energy is an issue. But then propagation, there are some less obvious differences, including um, uh, without getting too much into detail, Propagation characteristics are such that line of sight is much more likely, which means that we might have free space optical opportunity from air to ground, but certainly air to air, air to space, and for sure in space to space. The line of sight topology is both a blessing and a curse in the sense that you might result in big interference problems. Uh, let us think the, um, uh, the problem of what is often referred to as sellage problem, you are close to, as a terrestrial user, occasionally you are at sellage, you are close to, you are furthest away from your serving base station, but farthest from, sorry, you are furthest away from your serving base station and you are closest to the interfering base station. So that is a pathological case in the terrestrial network. But if you have a drone base station, that drone base station, maybe I just go back to this slide, it might be seeing in a line of sight manner 20 uh, outdoor small cells. And this is not to the scale. If the drone is here, they are pretty much all equidistant. So rather than one dominant interferer, you might have 19 dominant interferers. So the bottom line is interference is a big issue. So in our recent work, uh, we spent a lot of time on interference management, beam forming, and so on uh, in, uh, in UXMB, that is the UAV base station construct. And finally, what precisely is a UAV base station? It can be many things. It can be as simple as a relay, even in the form of an amplifier and forward. But it might have more functionalities and it might have be like a full small cell. And even I might use a Wi-Fi air interface uh, opportunistically. So I will actually pass through most of the slides remaining, which are talking about different research angles, uh, especially in the context of UXMB, that is the UAV base station. And I will go to concluding remarks uh, directly. Um, just let me have a sip of water here. If somebody asked, the, we actually wrote last year this magazine paper on whether 5G is ready for drones. And at the time, release 16 was not out yet. So this study was based on release 15. Uh, and the conclusion was, if you want to serve uh, UAVs, if UAV is a user, that is to a great extent doable with release 15. But if uh, within re release 15, you want to realize uh, a, a drone base station, that is difficult. And if we carry that discussion to 6G, uh, uh, without really getting again too much into detail, the Important point is the following. In such a complicated architecture, lots of uh, tangled and complex decisions have to be made in regards to communications, computing, and caching in a very dynamic environment. Uh, mind you that your base stations are moving now in a fast and distributed manner. So can you do this in regards to interference management, handoff, uh, route management, uh, it is difficult. So inevitably, machine learning will play a crucial role here. I generally give the following answer. Yes, aerial 
base stations can be tightly integrated if machine learning technology matures uh, sufficiently. Another uh, remark, uh, 4G and ICT empowered with 4G has been an important sector in the last decade, uh, in addition to many other sectors, whether it is transportation or agriculture. But this decade, connectivity will be at the heart of digital economy. So whether you are talking about healthcare or municipalities or public safety, no connectivity, you can't uh, realize them in a sophisticated manner. That is the reason, that is why we are making this emphasis to verticals. So connectivity, uh, 5G enabled connectivity and therefore ICT in my view will be the world's biggest uh, economical sector in this decade. But the most interesting part is the next decade, 2030s, 6G era, super connectivity, ultra connectivity there I think we can think there will be only one industry that is high tech and everything else is a subset of that. Another uh, concluding remark, which is interesting uh, in the last decade, uh, well, first telecom and computing uh, became tangled. We call it ICT. Uh, and in the last decade, uh, progressively, ICT became tangled with automotive industry, therefore this uh, autonomous and connected vehicle. As we move forward with AI as a big engine, we will see another merge, aerospace and space industry, space industry in general, but aerospace in general, will also merge with ICT as well. So um, if we are talking about an integrated global multi-layer network. Um, uh, it is uh, really not about only ICT, but with all these other uh, uh, tightly integrated sectors. So in conclusion, this uh, non-terrestrial networks paradigm, that is in other words, integrated space aerial terrestrial networks with a new uh, 6G core will uh, certainly be disruptive. This is not a hype. It is, we are not talking about a signal processing technology like turbo codes, which have been very uh, active research area for 10 years, but then we move to another coding scheme, whether it is LDPC or Polar, and then you don't hear about turbo codes anymore. No, it is not like that. This is not a hype. The foreseeable future, uh, this area will be uh, very, uh, active. I'm sorry, just getting tired a little bit here. Um, so um, uh, once again, it is not a hype. Uh, it is worth re-emphasizing that AI and machine learning will be key enablers in this very sophisticated architecture to the extent that um, we really cannot implement an equally sophisticated decision-making, RRM and otherwise. They have to be simple and that will be AI and machine learning. So 6G is once again, not telecommunications. It is diverse, multidisciplinary. As I alluded to, uh, uh, there will be very new players, already computing players, uh, which are the Googles and Amazons are, well, Google and Microsoft are part of uh, the telecom world. Um, whether it is a spectrum access and so on. Let me not, not get into those, but we will see new players and I anticipate retail industry will be one of them. And a very interesting one chart. Some of you might be aware that NASA has this super exciting, ambitious Artemis project. Um, uh, uh, there will most likely be human person on the moon after, I don't know, maybe two decades by 2024, just around the corner. So we will need a network on the moon. Moon will probably have a permanent station and there might be something like an ISS around the moon. 
So we need a net network on moon and some interconnected pipe between uh, moon and uh, the world. It's not difficult to imagine that there might be satellites around the moon. Those satellites might be communicating with satellites around the world and mm -hmm. so on. So these satellite networks in the next two decades will evolve to uh, full-fledged uh, space networks. In 60s and 70s, we had this Cold War days and big race between US and Soviet Union, space race. And I think uh, this decade and the next one, we will have space race two, second wave, this time uh, likely between US and China. I will actually uh, stop there. Next 20 years will be very interesting. Um, uh, if anyone would like to have the slides, drop me an email. Uh, I will be happy to send them. And at the end, we have our papers in this area, particularly aerial networks. Uh, I have new projects in uh, satellite networks, but uh, we just do not have much publications yet in that area. So some few journal papers out, uh, sorry, under review. These are all under review. And uh, I'm just looking at one particular paper. Um, well, anyhow, I, I couldn't see that. So these are papers from this year uh, on different aspects um, and from last year. And then uh, since 2016, that's the first year I started uh, to publish in this area. And likewise, uh, lots of conference papers in the pipe. And I was actually looking at this paper with uh, Güneş Hoca, Professor Güneş Karabulut, Kurt, with uh, colleagues from Istanbul Technical University. We submitted our first work on uh, inter-satellite secure communications and lots of papers from the previous years. Uh, many of these ideas were developed in discussions with my team members. And uh, in addition to them, Professor Güneş Kurt is a visiting professor this year at Carlton. Uh, very happy to have the opportunity to host her. And we have a sizable team and many international collaborators, uh, at least a dozen. And by inputting this link, this list, I was a bit hesitant because probably I missed quite many colleagues. If you are interested in collaboration or visiting Carlton, my lab in the last uh, 15 years hosted about 50 international uh, visitors from a couple of weeks to two years in the graduate student level, postdoctoral fellows and uh, professor level. And Cotutel dual degree is another possibility. Student might have a home university, say, uh, in, in Turkey or Iran or in Europe. And uh, at the end, the student gets two PhD degrees or one degree with two stamps from two universities. So once again, thank you. And I will just stop sharing my slides. It's already